London SRT Marine is a specialist in global maritime surveillance and security, as well as providing product safety systems. It's just produced interim results, uh, which show that it swung to a pre-tax profit on a more than fourfold increase in revenues. Simon Tucker, Chief Executive, and he joins us now. Simon, welcome. Thank I you. I want to get afternoon. more into the numbers uh, in just a minute or two. But before then, just explain the business model and what you're presenting to investors. So we sell what's called maritime domain awareness. So products that enable a person on a boat to understand what's going on around them, a port or water authority to control their ports and waterways, uh, digital autonomous shipping, and also for uh, fisheries authorities and coast guards to control and monitor their coastlines and what we call EEZ, so your, your, your maritime territory out to 200 miles. So in all that you do, what's brought about this change in fortunes um, between the loss last time and these interims which show a profit? As I said, there's more than fourfold increase as well in revenues. I suppose it's a sort of overnight success after 10 years of hard graft. Um, you know, we started this journey all these years ago, developing all this technology. And just as we were about to take off two and a half years ago, COVID hit. And as an international business, where 99% of what we make we sell abroad, everything just stopped. Last year, we started to see that recovery, customers coming back, re-engaging with us. We signed a £40 million contract in uh, January. We've got £600 million pipeline coming up. And so the interims is just the start of that uh, re-engagement that we've been long working towards. OK, I want to talk more about that pipeline in just a minute because that's in the, um, the outlook from here. But I want to get some more details about the numbers that you've had. This increase in revenues, you talk about this idea that you're just getting going now after 10 years of hard graft. Is that sort of improvement or um, quadrupling, if you like, um, going to be seen again? Or is this just a one off? Um, and is the profit sustainable at these levels as well? So I don't think we're going to quadruple our revenues every six months uh, as much as I would I would I would love that. Uh, remember, that's from a, a low base, a covid base. But I think um, what you see with our systems business, for example, we have contracts that range between 10 and 100 million pounds. And you don't need very many of those where you start to see when you when, you know, last year we did 8 million pounds worth of revenue. You see very quick incremental increases in uh, in revenue. And because of our margins, that falls straight down onto the bottom line. Yeah, well, part of this pipeline and part of the business that you're you're seeing now benefit from, you had this contract, I believe, recently in Southeast Asia, uh, which you've just brought on. Uh, explain more about that. And is that a contract which is out of the blue? Has it been worked on for a long while? Does it take a long while to get these sort of contracts up and running? So all our contracts take a long time to convert from idea into an actual contract where you're actually starting to deliver. So typically, it's about a three-year gestation period. When the customer first approaches you to say that I'm interested in a maritime surveillance system to when they sign on the dotted line and we start to uh, start to deliver. Um, we've had a contract in Southeast Asia, uh, which we signed three years ago, but the one that we signed more recently was in the Middle East. You talk about two areas there where I'm surprised looking into the detail and research for this interview. I'm surprised <laughs> that uh, that area of the world doesn't already have this sort of level of sophistication. Uh, in their surveillance for their maritime uh, work, because that's an area where there's a lot of shipping. And you'd have thought that by now they'd already be up and running. But my understanding is the, the business there pretty much ready for the picking. Is that the case or is that just my simplistic view of it? No, your, your, your view is absolutely correct. There is very little maritime domain awareness worldwide. I mean, you only have to look in the UK, where we have trouble enough spotting rubber boats across the very narrow straits that separate France and the UK. If you go further afield to places like the Middle East and Southeast Asia, and if you take the Philippines, they have 8,000 islands, 2 million square kilometers of, of EEZ, 300,000 fishing boats. Just to put that in context, the whole of Europe has 40,000 fishing boats, and they have no maritime surveillance of any, any type. The marine domain has never really been seen as very economically important or a threat. That has changed in the last 10 years. And we, by luck, saw that eight years ago and started to develop the solutions that would be needed. So, um, you know, I, I, without naming countries, I can name one country in Southeast Asia that you expect to have huge coverage. And I think they have one operational radar today. So, so how are you doing all this? Is it by radar, as you just said, or do you have drones? What, what, what's in the air that gives you this um, capability of, of this sort of level of monitoring? 
there's no one there's no one magic thing so there isn't a satellite that's parked over a particular country that sees all um, you have to fuse lots of different sensor systems so that they will be satellites they will be drones they'll be patrol vessels there'll also be the towers that you see along coastlines with radars and all sorts of different things i mean if i told you for example we have there are special sensors that will detect a light that is used when a fishing boat is fishing but if there's a light at sea it's probably not a whale or a fish it's probably a boat or a person and so that becomes a target so all of that comes together and what we do is then apply uh, analytics that we have developed and visualization techniques to be able to present that almost as air traffic control, but for boats on a screen and an operator, and out of the hundreds and thousands of targets, to be able to identify those three guys over there are most likely drug smuggling. That guy over there is most likely illegally fishing. That ferry over there has gone off track. You know, maybe there's a search and rescue event there, and therefore they can deploy their limited resources in these vast areas very efficiently and effectively. So, so you got what some sort of an alarm that rings when you're on a contract and you're able to oversee what's happening, and then you what you call the coast guard then and no, we and, don't. And that's... No, we don't. Um, we deliver a system. So this is rather this, if you can imagine Heathrow Airport has has um, air traffic control, has its own mm -hmm. air traffic control system. Uh, countries like the coast guard, let's say in uh, Southeast Asia uh, uh, country, want to have their own monitoring system with their own command center. And they see it on the screen and they then dispatch their patrol boats, et cetera, to deal with the problem. So they get the alarm, the alert, a little, you know, almost James Bond style. It bleeps on the screen and it tells them all the information. And they know, do they need to send a big boat because it's got a, a ferry with 100 people on it? Or is it a small boat when it's, uh, when it's weapon smuggling and we need to send something with a whole bunch of SAS people on it? So we deliver the system to the country as part of their uh, civil defense infrastructure. So... So have quite you grown up. made any? Have you made any approach to the the British uh, Coast Guard? You're talking there about little boats coming across from France. I mean, this would seem to be a good application uh, to try and ensure ultimately we save lives about these people coming across uh, and making sure that uh, the traffic is monitored across even that short space of distance between France and the UK. Uh, are you doing that contract? Is there a contract there? Do you think that could be established? I don't think there is a contract there. Um, we've obviously spoken to them the uk has some pretty heavy military assets in the area which get, which affords coverage which they've repurposed from you know uh, um, targeting things with missiles and stuff to actually be able to detect these rubber boats i think the issue across the channel is it's such a short space so by the time you detect it coming from the beach they're they're on our side of the water within about 15 minutes so i, I personally i don't think detection is a problem the problem is the numbers that are coming across in such a short short area so I, I don't bring... think there's business for us there. <laughs> well, I'm always looking for business. I'm sure you are, but yeah. uh, whatever. Let me, do, let me just bring up a share price chart if I can. Um, you'll know this really well. The, the lower red dotted line I've drawn here is the COVID lows we had back in March 2020 down at 23 pence. The, the, the dotted line I've drawn at the top were the highs we had back in January this year. And you've now peaked above that. So you're now back at pre-COVID levels. Um, COVID, I guess, was a bit of a headwind. In fact, you've already um, alluded to this, um, and now obviously you're coming out of this. Um, it, describe what's going on in the share price. What's priced in? What is the true value for a company of this sort of size and shape that you're developing? Well, I'm not in control of the share price. The, uh, the, the, the rational market is in control of it. I think there's two reasons for the shape of our curve, if you will. I think one is that um, we've taken longer than we expected to develop our business uh, and we've got it wrong at times. You know, I can't predict when uh, a government in the Middle East is going to sign on the dotted line. I try because I feel as though I should tell shareholders what we're doing. And therefore, sometimes we dis we've disappointed in the past. Um, COVID, of course, was then a bit of a hammer on that nail. Uh, and then, but at the same time, that gave us an opportunity to further develop our product. Um, and I think the interims and the news flow that's come out in the last six months has started to demonstrate to the market that actually we have a real product with a real, a not very large market that we're selling into and we've got traction. So we're building our credibility. And I think ultimately the share price will reflect that as to where that goes. Um, you know, we're not playing for a few hundred million pounds worth of business. We're, we're looking to build a, a big business in a multi-billion pound, very long term market. 
You know, when you when you have a Coast Guard customer and we sign a fifty million pound contract, that's not it. You know, there is a succession yeah. of contracts over the next 10, 20 years that will keep going, keep going. And we have first mover advantage. So how, how big a market are you selling into? Is it quantifiable? I mean, there's a lot of speculative um, uh, estimates, I imagine, about how much business there could potentially be be out there. Do we know the size of this market you're selling into? No, because it's kind of new, really. It's a little bit like uh, when the smartphone market came out. You say, well, what's the, what's the size of the smartphone market? You know, you d don't really know until actually you, whoever would have thought that two thirds of the world population would be walking around with a smartphone when they first came out. Probably not. I certainly wouldn't have forecast that. Um, I, it's slightly easier with our with our business in that you can look at the countries that don't have anything. So, uh, I get, again, take a country in Southeast Asia that's got 8,000 islands, 300,000 boats. And uh, on that, they've got something like um, 100,000 kilometers of coastline to protect and 2 million square kilometers of EZ. You can you can design a system that gives full coverage of that, which is what we've done with one customer. And they would have to spend about $1.2 billion, $1.2 billion on their system to have complete, complete and total high resolution coverage. They're not going to spend $1.2 billion in one contract with us. They might spend that over 20 years building up in a succession of, of, of contracts, a little bit like building an airline. You start with an A320 and then you progress and you buy a few more and then a 777, et cetera. But your ambition is to build a global airline. So um, I'm really, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to give that sort of forecast, but it is, it is enormous. And the, and the reason it's, those figures aren't sort of fantastical is that what they're doing is protecting, protect, if you take the Philippines, they export $2 billion a year of tuna. And you mm. don't need to, increase that very much and, and you're, you're getting an, an additional $500 million a year of revenue. 40% uh, of their protein comes from, from fish for their 100, 100 odd million population. There's huge oil and gas reserves and things. So you're, the, the sovereignty of your marine domain is, 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 uh, is super precious and worth that investment. Well, you say you've got a pipeline of 600 million, which sounds impressive. You've got a market cap of 90 million as of mm -hmm. today. Uh, you talk about a market where there's sounds like there's almost limitless amounts of potential. Um, how do you set targets? What are your targets? How long is it going to take you to eat through this pipeline of 600 million? And how quickly do you anticipate that growing? A lot of questions so, there. Yeah, there are a lot of questions and uh, good questions. The the purpose of the pipeline is, is we get lots of inquiries from all sorts of people because every country is looking to get a maritime domain awareness surveillance system of various types. And we could easily spend all our resources, we are still only 100 people, running around the world seeing all these people. So what we do is we say, well, who is, who is really serious, who's really got the money, who's got the political will to do it, who's taking the decision to proceed? And that's worth spending, focusing 90% of our resources on those. And that is the 600 million pounds worth. And there's about 20 odd contracts opportunities in there with different customers and things. And so we focus our, our time on, on that. We would hope to see though that 600 million convert into contracts over the next three years. That's our, that's our hope. We can't guarantee that because the government does what it wants when it wants, but that's our hope. Within that 600 million, there's 230 million pounds worth of contracts that actually we believe are really in their final contracting process and, and pretty close. Um, so it's a sort of conveyor belt that will sort of keep, keep going. And, and what, is, what is our target? You know, we try to live within our means um, and we uh, will build our business as those uh, contracts, uh, contracts come in. Yeah. So um, let me just uh, ask you then um, what's happening in the next six months, year or so, I suppose, till the end of your full fiscal year end. <laughs> Um, anything that's developing? Yes, there are five contracts that uh, we expect to have some news on, which are worth 230 million pounds. And of course, you know, there's the big news when we sign them and then we need to deliver them. And they have a delivery time of anywhere between a year and two years, depending on them. So that's our focus for the next six months, as well as delivering the 70 million pounds with the contracts we already have under contract. Um, and for those of, you know, listeners and stuff, you want to see a little bit of a sort of visual story of what we've been doing. We have a gallery on our website where pictures of, you know, our customers using it and all that sort of stuff is, is around and you, you'll get a good feel as to what's, what's going on. So there's a lot, um, a lot happening, perhaps a bit too much, but, but you know, I'm not, I'm not complaining about that.
Uh, of course, it's always nice to be overworked, I guess, in your situation. Look, Simon, it's a pleasure. Thanks indeed for joining us. It's been great to be able to catch up with the interesting area of the market. Watch this space. You can track us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We will. OK, Simon, thanks so much. That's uh, Simon Tucker. He's chief executive of SRT Marine.